information. We got a lot of response to this. A lot of people said they're really um, interested to be hearing um, our next guest. And of course, we post these presentations online at the end of the day each Monday. So a lot of people have an opportunity to view them, even if they can't make it to the presentation themselves. Uh, we have two folks who are with us today from the State um, Office of Indigent Defense. Our presenter is Tom Maher. He is going to be um, talking to us about uh, the organization and what he does as executive director, but do want to also recognize Susan Brooks, who is also with the office, and she is here today as well. So Tom is the executive director, and if you don't know, IDS oversees the provision of counsel to indigent defendants in criminal cases also to parents in abuse, neglect, dependency, and termination of parental rights cases through the Public Defender's Office and also private assigned counsel. He previously practiced criminal defense in state and federal court. He handling both retained and appointed cases, including capital murder and other incredibly serious charges. Uh, he also teaches trial practice at the Duke University School of Law. The subject of indigent defense is uh, one that is not only has uh, some basic facts behind it, but as Tom described to me in his presentation, or his description of this presentation, he said that historically he believes that it's really been treated as a partisan issue. But he says that is changing, and that's one of the things he's going to be talking about today. Tom says there's an increasing awareness that the philosophical and the practical value of competent defense against the government's ability to charge, convict, and punish people through the criminal justice system really does cut across political ideology. Today, he's going to be looking at the value of indigent defense from a nonpartisan perspective and explain why he believes it is a critical component of any criminal justice reform. With that, I give you Tom Maher. Thank you. Uh, first, I do sincerely want to thank you for the opportunity to come speak with you. I am a little bit more nervous than I expected. I didn't realize I'd be live tweeted. I've never had that <coughs> happen to me before. Uh, and, and I do appreciate uh, the policies of free market and personal responsibility, which as I understand means you bring your own lunch. Um, I'm here to talk about why indigent defense matters. And I will say I've been doing I've been involved as a criminal defense attorney for decades. I've worked my current job for over seven years. I've been to a lot of meetings, uh, and they generally are filled with lawyers, defense lawyers, and people who kind of already buy into the notion that indigent defense matters. Uh, and it probably isn't a big surprise that that means that the groups are generally liberal. They're more Democrat than Republican. They have certain political leanings. And so I guess one of the questions is why am I, and I work for the state government, I am a moderate Democrat, uh, and I actually believe that what I do is a good use of taxpayer money. So why am I here talking to the John Locke Foundation about that? Uh, well, I think that if you really think about what indigent defense does, uh, it is not the typical government program. Uh, we are perhaps unique in a, being a program that is designed, although funded by the government, to oppose the government and to limit government power. So um, why is it that you all should care about the right to counsel? Um, you know, I was thinking about this some, you know, why is it that people don't like the right to counsel? Well, I think there's two components. One is it costs money, taxpayer money. And secondly, that money is perceived as going towards criminals, people who don't deserve taxpayer support. And from that perspective, it's certainly understandable that it is not a popular uh, activity. I've had legislators friendly legislators look at me and say, Tom, you do understand that your agency is not everybody's favorite agency, and I do. Uh, but, you know, there was a time when public defenders were actually viewed as worthy of hero status in comic books. This is an actual cover. And why is that? Well, people, criminal defense lawyers in general, and public defenders specifically, stand between citizens and residents of this country and the government. And they stand there from life and death cases, capital cases, 
through cases where you face decades in prison, to what we think of as minor cases but have profound impact on the people who are being prosecuted from inability to get jobs in the future, inability to have licenses, even loss of children. Uh, and for many, many people who are going through the justice system or the criminal justice system, they cannot afford to hire counsel. Uh, and without the right to counsel, they are literally on their own facing the government on that. And, and this is why it's important that when the government is exercising what may be its supreme power, that the people who face that power are represented by skilled advocates who have the resources to do the job correctly. Um, let's start uh, with the basics. This is a constitutional right. The Sixth Amendment, what we do is a constitutional right. And I thought about, uh, and Susan and I were talking about on the way here, why does it feel so different to talk about the right to counsel than say the First Amendment or the Second Amendment or the Fourth Amendment? Well, a lot of amendments very strictly limit the government. The First Amendment says the government cannot tell you what to say, that cannot tell you what to think. Fourth Amendment says they can't come into your house or invade your privacy. The Second Amendment, whether you're in favor of guns or not, limits the government's ability to control those. The Sixth Amendment, when we talk about it, we're saying, well, give us tax money to pay lawyers. That doesn't feel the same. But <clears throat> when you think about it, it is very much the same. Because the reason we have counsel and the reason it's important to have counsel is it is those individual lawyers who limit the government's power in individual cases. Without the lawyers and the support for the lawyers to stand up to the government, the government power in criminal can run amok. And so just like the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment limit the government, the Sixth Amendment is very much designed to also limit the government. And while it's a tax-funded, proactive system, I would suggest it's equally important uh, to any other constitutional right. Um, the right to counsel, I realized in preparing for this uh, that uh, because I generally talk to lawyers, I generally assume everybody knows kind of the basics, and that's probably a mistake, and I'll try not to do that. Back in 1963, the United States Supreme Court decided Gideon, and most of you probably at least are aware of the concept. But here's the very basic holding, which is that in our adversary system that we have in this country, uh, you cannot be assured of a fair trial without a lawyer. And if you are unable to afford a lawyer, if the government wants to exercise its power, it has to provide you a lawyer. Uh, it is a principle I think uh, we should all get behind uh, on that. And it would be nice if I was coming here to tell you that, in fact, we have all lived up to what we call Gideon's promise. And in fact, every day when somebody's hailed into court, their lawyer has the time and skill and resources to, to do the job. Unfortunately, that is not true. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm here to talk to you. This is a quote from a recent report, recent 2009, from the National Right to Counsel Committee that talks about all the problems that we are facing in doing indigent defense. And a lot of them stem from funding, but they don't all stem from funding. But you have public defenders, and when I say public defenders, I'm referring both to kind of the classic full-time salaried public defender, but also the private lawyers we rely on throughout North Carolina who do this work who are simply not given the resources to be able to do their job. And so that they are not able to stand up to the government, they are not able to adequately represent their clients on that. Uh, and so this is a state of indigent defense. Now, uh, interesting side note, uh, historically, Gideon was a case that came out of Florida. Uh, and prior to Gideon, in North Carolina, there was no absolute right to counsel. It was up to a judge to decide whether if you were charged with a felony, would they give you a lawyer? And historically, North Carolina, to be honest, didn't do a great job at that. There were defendants, quite frankly, who one, I think I read about, had a third grade education, had to defend themselves in court without a lawyer. Another one went through a trial where the judge said, don't worry, I'll look out for your interests. Well, that's not a judge's job. So Gideon came up, uh, and Florida, the Attorney General, sent out a letter to Attorney Generals in other states and says, we would like other states to support us in opposing the right to counsel. And the vast majority of other attorney generals said, thank you for letting us know we're going to support Gideon because we think it's actually important that people have lawyers. North Carolina was one of two states that supported Florida, North Carolina and Alabama. Uh, and fortunately for North Carolina, we came out on the wrong side of history. Uh, now, as I said, things are not going well in North Carolina, though they're, they're not terrible. 
they are going terribly in many places. If you were to Google the words engine defense, uh, I think the word you would find most often associated with it is crisis. Uh, there are report after report of the problems uh, with engine defense. Uh, and part of it is innocent people get convicted. Part of it is people's uh, aren't dealt with. Uh, it has gotten to the point where we have, this is a recent uh, federal decision where the courts are getting involved and in telling the funders of indigent defense how they have to fund indigent defense. Uh, in fact, uh, the most recent one I found is this one. In West Virginia, they have literally run out of money halfway through the year. Uh, and so the private lawyers who are doing this work are now being paid $20 an hour for their travel time. Uh, and if you've been to West Virginia, it is not a kind of urban metropolis. There's a lot of travel. And if you run a private business, you understand that $20 an hour doesn't begin to cover overhead. So it becomes very, very hard for the lawyers to spend the time that they need to do the work. So why am I saying that this is a nonpartisan issue? Well, I think it should be a nonpartisan issue. I think the Sixth Amendment is that important. But it has increasingly become one. And I think in some respects that's very gratifying. This is uh, from a recent meeting I attended uh, up in Washington, D.C., hosted by the federal government. And I've been to a number of these types of meetings in the past. And generally, you go up there, and, and it's a bunch of indigent defense types sitting around talking about how the system needs more money. And then everybody goes home, and nothing happens. Uh, this was hosted by the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. And it's called the Right to Counsel Consortium. And the idea is to get the word out and educate people more about the importance of the right to counsel. And I managed to get myself invited. And there were three people from North Carolina there. Uh, I was the only lawyer. The other two were law enforcement officers. And in fact, one of the law enforcement officers had been the chief of police in Greenville, North Carolina. And he got up and talked about, from his perspective, why it mattered that the public defenders worked well. He, Perfectly honest that in court, their adversaries, they recognize that sometimes they don't see eye to eye. But when they go out into the community, the community views the criminal justice system as a whole. Uh, and if the public defender isn't doing their job and people feel like they're not treated fairly by the courts, that affects their relations with the police. Uh, and so that if you don't have a fully functioning system from well-trained police to well-funded prosecutors, judges who have time, and public defenders, the community views the whole government system as broken because, in some respects, it is. Uh, the other interesting thing about this meeting is, as typical, there were foundations there. There's always some funders who are funding some new project. And one of the funders who was there is the Open Society Foundation. For those of you who know them, they're founded by George Soros, who I think most people would view as a liberal and supporting kind of liberal causes. And you would expect to be at this type of meeting. Importantly, however, the other big funder that was there were the Koch brothers. Uh, and I will say uh, the Koch brothers uh, are getting a lot of press. And about, I don't know, six months, 12 months ago, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, which is a national group of, of folks who do all sorts of criminal defense work, announced that they had gotten a substantial amount of money from Koch Industries to support indigent defense. And I had to read that twice. I thought, is there a different Coke Industries? Because they're not the people who, if you were kind of making a short list of folks to support indigent defense, would come to mind. But the truth is, they are the perfect supporters for it. And they have been involved in it for over 10 years. They haven't been seeking publicity for it. Only when it got known was their publicity. But you know, Charles Koch and uh, Mark Holden, who's their general counsel, have made it perfectly clear why they support this. Because opposing the government when it's trying to take your freedom is a bedrock principle. And it should be a principle that applies to everybody. They have had a small but you know, important number of criminal investigations involving their company. And as they have pointed out, we could afford the best. It really isn't an issue for us. But going through that, recognizing the importance for poor people was really driven home. In fact, Mark Holden's kind of an interesting guy if you ever get a chance to read about him. Uh, in college, I guess it was, he actually worked for relatively low wages as a prison guard and recognized that a number of the people he was seeing were people who he had grown up with who ended up falling off the tracks or taking a different approach and how their lives were being affected on that. Uh, and so Koch Industries and the Charles Koch uh, Foundation have become very deeply involved in criminal justice reform, and as part of that is indigent defense. And so one of the questions, I guess, is, well, why now? Why would this group, uh, 
uh, who clearly are, are, if you had a Venn diagram of George Soros and the Koch brothers, probably the only way they would overlap is on this issue. Why are they involved in this and why is this important? Why now? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, why are we seeing this shift? Uh, and in fact, I think if you pay attention to some of the presidential candidates, you'll find people on both sides talking about the need for criminal justice reform in a way that you wouldn't have heard 10 years ago. Well, one is overuse of the criminal justice system. Uh, we have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. Uh, in a recent interview I read with Mark Holden, he pointed out we are spending as a nation $80 billion a year to lock people up. And the, when the government is doing that, it's not just a waste of money, it is a waste of human capital unless you actually need to do it. Uh, and it's not just people being locked up. We think about prison as kind of the ultimate use of government power, but there's a significant number of people who are on probation. And I will say as a criminal defense lawyer, I always say, ooh, probation, I got a great result for my client. Probation is a government official controlling some of what you do. Uh, and if you don't do it right, then you get to graduate to prison or jail. People coming out on parole are subject to this. Uh, the other thing the government that we're overusing is the type of criminal laws. When Enron catastrophe happened, the federal government passed various laws that, quote, make sure it didn't happen again, including some fairly strict laws about destruction of, of documents and things for fraud investigations. Uh, and then they brought a prosecution against a man named Yates. Mr. Yates was a fisherman. Uh, and his crime was you're not supposed to catch red grouper that are less than 20 inches long. Uh, and he had some that were like 19 inches long. And he threw them overboard to hide the fact that he was catching undersized grouper. While there are specific and fairly modest laws that deal with that, the government prosecuted him under the Enron law saying that the destruction of the fish was the equivalent of destroying financial records. Uh, and one of the reasons that's important is that law carries a 20-year prison sentence. He didn't get 20 years, but they chose to roll out a financial crime with 20 years penalty to go after a fisherman who had thrown some red groupers overboard. Now, the US Supreme Court ultimately said that's not what the law means, though to be honest, they had to kind of struggle to get there. And the dissent said, well, actually, that is what the law says, but this is a really good example of overuse of criminal power uh, on that. And you know, North Carolina is not immune to that. We don't have you know, the federal government. Uh, this is a recent study from the Manhattan Institute that talks about overcriminalization in North Carolina. We have something like 70 different ways you can get your driver's license revoked. We do not have the world's best public transportation system. And if you look at criminal dockets, you'll see tons of people being criminally prosecuted for driving while license revoked. And it doesn't mean they were bad drivers. They may not have paid uh, a speeding citation. Uh, and then they end up with criminal records. Uh, it probably doesn't come as a surprise that the government doesn't always get it right. Uh, there are case after case, and these are just North Carolina cases, where people who got not only prosecuted but convicted, in some cases sentenced to decades in prison, in some cases uh, sentenced to death, turned out to be factually innocent. They just had not done this. Uh, recent uh, information from the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence is that so far, uh, $34.5 million had to be paid to the people, and there are some major cases still pending. And that is just the tip of the iceberg of the cost. Those people spent decades in prison. Their families were affected. Their children were affected. Their communities were affected. And now, of course, on a purely financial side, uh, the municipalities and others are all being affected by that. Uh, here's another thing I think is worth thinking about and why this matters and has become increasingly important is criminal convictions, even for what we think of as minor, have major consequences. Uh, in my field, they're often referred to as collateral consequences. And that's because going to prison is a direct consequence. The judge orders you to go to prison. Being on probation is a direct consequence. These are all, quote, collateral. It's not a direct result. The judge doesn't order them. But that makes them sound unimportant. For many people with, quote, minor offenses, these are the biggest form of punishment that we have. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from what's called CCAT. It's the Collateral Consequences Assessment Tool. 
This was developed by the School of Government in conjunction with uh, staff at IDS. Uh, and this is a tool that's online that lawyers and others, judges, anybody, can go in and try to figure out if somebody is convicted of this misdemeanor or this felony, what are the consequences for them? What jobs will they not be able to have? Will it affect licensing or housing or any number of things? And the fact that you have to have this tool says something about the scope of these consequences. There are over 700 in North Carolina. That doesn't include federal consequences from state convictions, and it doesn't include some things like immigration or even driving consequences, because trying to grapple with all that, quite frankly, was more than they could do with this. So if you go there, you can figure out, OK, what types of consequences I'm looking for? Employment. Well, if I look at employment, <coughs> what types of employment? This is alphabetically just a short snippet of all the different types of employment that are affected in North Carolina by having a criminal conviction. And that can include a misdemeanor conviction. And you should keep in mind, you know, when you think about criminals, you think about people who've done really bad, dangerous things. And there are absolutely those types of people. And they absolutely need to be prosecuted and, and be in prison. But fishing without a license is a crime in North Carolina. Driving, I think it's 15 miles an hour over the speed limit if you're over 70 miles an hour, that's a crime. Uh, I was at a legislative meeting where one of the legislators finally said, you know what part of the problem with all this is? Is we are devaluing the notion of what it means to be a criminal because there are so many people who get labeled as criminals for doing things that, quite frankly, you know, you could deal with as a civil infraction or some other way. So this is just a list partial. I couldn't fit them all on of the types of jobs that are affected. And so if you pick one, you find out that the state, for example, a limits you being a manicurist or doing natural hair extensions if you have any felony conviction. Uh, and the notion that that's not overreaching, I think, we need to think about. Uh, recently, in getting ready for this, I saw a decision out of a Pennsylvania Court of Appeals. And Pennsylvania has a, a more protective due process clause than the US Constitution, so this opinion may not apply outside of Pennsylvania, but they dealt with a law that said if you have a one prior conviction, you can never work in an assisted care facility for the elderly and some others. Uh, and at first blush, most people say, oh, that's good. You wouldn't want my elderly mother having you know, a rapist take care of her. But of course, that's not what the law says. The law says any conviction, so, and it says any job. So there were people in this lawsuit a guy who was 52 who had been convicted when he was 18 for riding in a stolen car that one of his friends had and had never been arrested again, had served probation, and for 30 years had done nothing, and he couldn't be a cook in this assisted care facility. And the lawsuit, and this was interesting, wasn't just brought by the people who were being affected individually. It was brought by one of the facilities. Because you know when the notion here isn't that facilities should have to hire people with criminal records. The notion is that they should be able to decide who they hire. That they should be able to make an independent judgment based on the individual person and their record and their skills and everything they've done, whether they want to hire them. And that the government should be very reluctant to step in and tell a private individual and a private company that they can't, in essence, work together. And fortunately, in Pennsylvania, they have a broader due process protection. The court said, you know what? This lifetime ban that's so broad violates due process. It is not rational to tell these companies that they can't make the choice to hire these people. But it is just the tip of the iceberg for the type of consequences that happen to people with criminal convictions. So uh, these issues, I think, uh, have all gotten a lot of attention. They've been boiling for years, uh, but they've become incredibly important. And while they affect folks who hire their own lawyers, the reality is most people who go through the criminal justice system are represented by public defenders. So when you talk about things like mass incarceration or overuse of the criminal justice system or getting it wrong or protecting people from unwanted consequences, the people who stand there are the public. I do like these comic book covers. <laughs> I, I promise that's the last one, but it's my favorite. Uh, on that. Okay, so North Carolina. Why am I here talking to you? Well, I guess part of the question may be, why didn't I think of coming to talk to you all earlier? I should have. Uh, 
and I appreciate that. But I wanted to talk to you a bit about what's going on in North Carolina, because while it's a national issue, and I think of interest to everybody, it is of specific interest in North Carolina right now. Uh, in the year 2001, North Carolina created IDS, where I work, the agency. And it was created as an independent agency. 13 commissioners oversee us. They're appointed by a variety of folks, the Chief Justice, the Senate, the House. Uh, and we were tasked with uh, some important statutory goals. Improve quality of representation, enhance oversight for the people doing representation, develop uniform policies, uh, generate reliable data, which I will say as a lawyer at first I didn't understand how important that is. But if you want to know whether something's working and you care about it, you've got to measure what you're doing. Uh, and then ultimately, and I view this one as kind of wrapping up what we do, is deliver services in the most efficient and cost-effective manner without sacrificing quality representation. Now, when this got started, I was in private practice. I was out doing my own thing. I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, but we were fortunate that the people who started IDS had a pretty good vision and worked very hard to make it a success. Um, and you know, this right now will just give you, I'm not going to go into all the details. I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards. Kind of a, a map of how North Carolina operates. These are the counties. Uh, the colored counties have a public defender office. And what that means is there's full-time lawyers, hopefully investigators and other support staff, who handle most, though not all, of the cases in their counties. Um, you'll see that most counties actually don't have a public defender office. Uh, most of the counties that do are the larger counties, Mecklenburg, obviously, Wake, the places where there's enough volume to make sense. Though, for various reasons, there are other places as well. Carteret County, for reasons I could never explain, has a public defender's office. Um, the rest of the counties, we rely on private lawyers. So they're either appointed individually by a judge and paid by the hour, or in the counties where you see the hash marks, we've recently developed a contract system where we contract directly with lawyers. They agree to cover a caseload during the year for a set amount. They report to us what they're doing. We provide some training and supervision, and we work with the private lawyers that way. Uh, it, and this just barely scratches the surface. It is actually a fairly complicated system, and it requires somebody, we think it should be IDS, but somebody to pay attention to it. It doesn't run itself. If you want you know, your money well spent, you need to hold people accountable. You need to provide oversight, and, and that's what we do. Uh, obviously, for the legislature, and I understand this, and for taxpayers, I certainly understand it, the cost is an, an important issue. And you'll see that, and these are very general figures, back in 2001 when we began, if you took all the cases that were disposed and all the costs and divided them up, we would have spent $370 per disposition. Uh, now we are in 2014, and it's gone up by about $2. Uh, and part of that is because rates have been reduced. But it does reflect that IDS as an agency takes managing the cost very seriously. It isn't just because we are all taxpayers and actually appreciate that, but we understand that we're given limited funds. And if we don't pay attention to what we're doing with them, uh, we can't manage them. I have been accused by many people of having become a bean counter. Uh, and I actually take that label proudly because I say to people, if you don't count your beans, somebody's going to go hungry. Uh, and that's part of my job. The other thing, of course, then is, well, are the lawyers somehow milking the system? Are they working too hard? Can't we gain efficiency? Everything is about gaining efficiency. Uh, and this is an, an interesting thing. Uh, we, of course, track on average how many hours do the lawyers who are, are billing by the hour bill for cases. Uh, and that's the top. And we've got district court misdemeanors, which are, although they can be very important to people, they are the least serious. They are the ones that take less time. We spend about 3.3 .3 hours on them. Superior Court H&I, those are low-level felonies. They're felonies, but they're lower level. And then B1, B2 are the most serious felonies other than murder. So these are non-murder cases, and those are 36 hours. Both Missouri and Texas recently did studies saying, let's not just look at what we are doing. Let's look at what we should do. Are we spending enough time on these cases? And they had outside consulting companies and a university look at it. And what they said, and it was interesting, Missouri came out first. I remember reading, and they said 11.7 hours for misdemeanors. I said, that's crazy talk. You know, that can't be right. Uh, and then Texas came out and said, well, actually, it is, it is right. And you start realizing, you know, there's this phrase that, you know, uh, what were once vices become habits. You get used to cutting corners. You get used to not doing what you should do. And then it feels like that's appropriate. 
And it's useful to step back and think, wait a minute, maybe it's not. And on the high level felonies, we actually are pretty close. I think the lawyers recognize and the system recognizes that those are serious cases. But on the low level things that can affect people's jobs and affect their lives, there is this tendency to start moving towards what I think may be over efficiency. And it may save us some money in the short run, but then in the long run, you've got people with criminal records who don't deserve to have those. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to get out and talk not just to you but other, other groups is that we have been making some steps back. Uh, and as you all know, you know we've had a long running uh, budgetary problems. General Assembly's had to spend less money. We, we recognize that. Teachers have grounds to complain. Prison guards, state troopers, a lot of people aren't properly funded. But it has affected indigent defense on that. Uh, we had to, in 2000, and 11 reduce our rates from $75 per hour to as low as $55 per hour. Now when I talk to people who aren't either small business people or lawyers, they say, wow, I'd work for $55 an hour. And yes, you would if you didn't have overhead and you were paid for every hour and somebody else paid your insurance and your rent. But these are private lawyers who have to pay all their overhead out of that. And it must have been, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, the state bar did a survey to figure out what overhead, overhead rates were. And back then, for a small firm, it was like $48 an hour before the lawyers got paid. So somebody making $55 an hour is probably doing really well if they're paying themselves $15 an hour. I mean, the plumbers and car mechanics are doing far better. And we're still left with millions in unpaid fees. And the way that works is this year, for example, we were left with $6 million in unpaid fees. Well, we owe the money. So when the fiscal year 2016 budget comes in, we take $6 million of that money and pay last year's bills, which means now we're already behind it. Uh, the public defenders who are on salary didn't get salary cuts, but they haven't seen raises. They have seen increasing caseloads, uh, and it has affected them as well. So for example, we did a survey. PAC for us refers to private appointed counsel. Like any government agency, we get fond of acronyms. I actually remember being at a government a meeting of government agencies in, in the District of Columbia, and there must have been 50 agencies there. And they said, everybody go around and introduce yourself, and if you've got an acronym, tell us what it stands for. And by the time they got to the fourth person, he said, I'm so-and-so, and he said, you know what? I don't really know what the acronym stands for. And I thought, That's pretty typical. Um, so the private assigned counsel, the pay has been reduced. They have to reduce resources, which means they don't have support staff. Experienced attorneys are saying, I'm sorry, I believe in good government, I believe in Gideon, but I can't continue to do this, I cannot do that. A uh, significant number are dropping or beginning to drop. And because of this, you at some point see a decline in quality. Lawyers, even lawyers who care and want to do well, have got to pay their bills. And if you are losing money on your appointed cases, you have to cut corners on that to do other things uh, on that. Uh, and so we've seen districts where people are not taking cases. Uh, I've had calls from judges saying, please help us find lawyers to come into my county to do these cases. Uh, it, it is becoming a problem. And it wasn't at first because people were willing to work with the system. They expected it to come back. They were invested in it, but they couldn't keep it up. Same with the uh, public defenders. We did a survey. And I will say I was surprised by the number of lawyers working more than full time in a public defender's office who are carrying second jobs. And one of them pointed out to me, which I hadn't really thought about, you know, you're in court, and you're represented by this professional, and your life is in their hand, and then you go to the mall that weekend, and they're selling you shoes. Now, what does that tell you about this? And I will say, I suspect the situation is similar for assistant district attorneys, and they also play an important role. Uh, and they just don't have the time to spend on all the cases on that. So, and, and this is one I think is actually kind of telling, because it's, quote, a minor thing, a second degree trespass, but of course, that was important to the client. And when they had the time, it made a difference. Uh, and it can really make a difference. I had an email just last week from a woman who was picked up on some misdemeanor charges. She was employed. She had a job. And her bond was set at 5000 secured. She couldn't pay it. Two weeks where she was at risk of losing her job. And her public defender, who's a good lawyer, just did not have time to get her bond reduced for two weeks. So she spent two weeks in jail on that. OK, and diminished independence. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, it's interesting, we are a government agency. Uh, but the interesting thing is that an ind indispensable element of the effective performance of defense counsel's responsibilities is the ability to act independently of the government to oppose it in adversary litigation. 
It is absolute constitutional requirement that when a lawyer is representing you in court, they are representing you. They're not representing the judge. They, they aren't being you know, obstructionist for the sake of being obstructionist. But if the case needs time, they're going to spend time on it. And when it's lawyers paid by the government, the best way to ensure independence is to house them in as independent an agency as you can. It doesn't mean we kind of run amok. The General Assembly gives us the budget. They oversee us. We, you know, we are very much uh, accountable. But once we've got that budget, it is our responsibility to make sure it's used for the way it's supposed to be used. And that's why, for example, in the ABA, one of their 10 principles is independence. It is a recognized thing. And up until recently, IDS was kind of a, a role model for independence. Accountable, but independent. Uh, last General Assembly session, by the time the final budget came out, IDS had been moved to within the Administrative Office of the Courts. Administrative Office of the Courts is a fine institution run by wonderful people, but their function is running the court system, not playing this adversary role. They represent the judges, the clerks, the courthouses. Uh, and now we have been moved to within AOC, and the director has control over our budget. And we're fortunate that we have a director who is supportive of independence and you know, isn't abusing that power in any way. And in fact, importantly, this was a move that was opposed not just by the administrative office, of course, but the chief justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, who understands both that IDS needs to be independent, but that the administrative office of the courts needs to focus on its function, and the two shouldn't be combined. But that has happened. Uh, and what's happening going forward, in addition to that move, there was a direction that there be a legislative study. Uh, by what's called JPS Oversight, which is a, a, one of the subcommittees that meets when they're not in session. They're supposed to report recommendations about the future of IDS and, and how we operate uh, for the next short session, which begins, I think, late April. Uh, and then the Chief Justice has a commission, which if you're interested in the court system as a whole, is a fascinating thing to watch because it's very broad-based, very ambitious. Uh, one of the things, out of many things that we're looking at, is indigent defense. Their report isn't due until 2017. I hope that whatever changes they suggest being made are not kind of mooted out by decisions that may be made before then. So we're at a time where indigent defense and criminal justice reform I think is important nationally, regardless of where you are. But in North Carolina, because of a kind of a number of things that have come together, it's of particularly importance now because there may be changes being made. I have, I think if I'm looking right about 10 minutes, for any questions or comments. And I really do appreciate you all coming here and listening. Um, in North Carolina, we have a general standard, which is a judge. The decision is made by a judge. There is a two-page affidavit that's filled out that lists your income, your assets, your debts fairly basic financial information from which a judge then looks at and makes a determination, can you afford counsel? Now, in some states, there are kind of concrete guidelines. You know, you look at 200% of the federal poverty guideline or things of that nature. We have not taken that approach, and I think for a couple of reasons. One is what, what you could afford for a trespass charge is very different than what you could afford for a robbery charge or murder charge. And rural counties are different than urban counties. And the judges are probably in the best position to know, realistically, can this person hire one of the lawyers who appears in front of them or not? Uh, states that have these kind of hard and fast rules often find that either they're denying counsel to some people who need counsel, or they have to have enough exceptions that the hard and fast rule loses some of its benefits. It would certainly be nice to have kind of an algorithm that told you that. But I think given the complexity of the system, that's very hard to do. Um, no. Uh, I will say there are different reasons I think judges act differently. In the bigger areas, Mecklenburg and Wake, for example, there's a public defender office. And I think judges kind of think to themselves, the public defender can handle this. We're not really spending extra money. And it is really bad for everybody to have somebody forced to represent themselves. Not only does it bad for the client, it's generally bad for the system. It slows things down. Etc. So I think judges, if there's a legitimate basis for an appointment, will do an appointment. One of the things I think is important to keep in mind, in North Carolina, if you're convicted, the judge can order you to repay the value of attorney services. So if there's a people in the gray area, you think, you know, maybe they can afford it, maybe they couldn't. 
If you end up appointing counsel and they're convicted, they're the ones most likely to repay the cost. We collect, it's gone down recently because of, of how tax refunds are, are being issued, but we collect probably $10 million a year in people repaying attorney's fees. And so I think that gives the judges some sense, well, I'm not going to give a lawyer to somebody who clearly can afford it, but if I'm not quite sure, I do know at the end of this, you know, if they're convicted, they're going to repay it. And so I may err on the side of caution. Yes? You mentioned the, the compensation. Could you speak to case flow to compare that to private attorneys doing you know, similar yes. work? And also related to that, uh, what effect does that have, let's say, on a lawyer trying to cut a plea bargain deal with maybe, you know, a, yeah. We, yeah, probably we have our best information about caseloads for the full-time public defenders because we have a reporting system and we know for each lawyer in the office at the end of the year how many cases they've disposed of. Uh, and I will tell you that in terms of, let's say, misdemeanors, which are the lowest level, they will routinely in the course of a year dispose of, I don't know, five, six, seven hundred cases. Uh, felonies fewer, but s still very large number. There are some national standards that suggest that 400 misdemeanors is the most in a year, and 150 felonies is the most. And we probably exceed those quite often. Now, I will say, as with all standards, really general standards are hard to apply because, you know, a B1 rape case is much more complex than a residential burglary. But I think most of the full-time lawyers are handling more cases than they should. Now, I spent, before I came to this job, I was in private practice. Uh, and I worked for two years for nonprofit, but the rest of the time, I was a classic private practice lawyer. People came in and hired me. Uh, and I did some court-appointed work. I would do death penalty cases. I did some federal stuff. There was no year in which I handled 150 felonies because you just cannot spend the time. And if people had the resources to hire me, I would quote a fee that allowed me to spend the time, and I would spend the time. Uh, and as a result, not because I was necessarily a brilliant lawyer, some people would probably suggest I'm not, but because I had the time to really dig into the case, I could make a difference. And you know, I, I did a case years ago in which everybody thought my client had allowed these two little boys to drown or nearly drown in a pool. And if I had not had the time and resources to really dig into it, I wouldn't have discovered that in fact that isn't what happened. So time makes a huge difference. And our public defenders, I will say, and the private lawyers who do this are good lawyers. This is not you know, people who can't get a job, but the time constraints are, are tremendous. And I am one of the people that impose those because I'm very conscious of the costs. And so people may be driven to take pleas because they aren't in a position to really dig into the case or dig into the person's background. I mean, the reality is most people who are charged with a crime are, may well be guilty of something, but they may have mental illness. They may have substance abuse. They may have things that, when presented to a prosecutor or a judge, would convince the prosecutor, this is somebody I don't want to saddle with a criminal record. There's a better way to deal with it so that they can continue to work. And that just takes time uh, on that. This is a great presentation, but I'm going to challenge you on something following up mm -hmm. on the point you just made about being guilty. Mm -hmm. And the question would be, I, I'm sure that there is a significant number of the defendants who are guilty and without counsel would quickly be convicted and prevent, uh, given their, their due punishment but that because they have um, government-provided counsel, not at their expense, but for free, that that counsel is able to delay things uh, at cost to the taxpayer and uh, just throw a wrench in the system. And, and so my question would be, of your budget, how much of it goes to that kind of representation? I have no idea. And let me just say, so, you've raised a couple of very important points. Absolutely, most people who are charged are guilty, at least of something. I will say prosecutors sometimes overcharge. And that's an important distinction because being guilty of the most serious offense may be very different from being guilty of a lesser offense. Uh, but of course, we don't want the government getting to decide who's guilty. That's the whole point of counsel. People who don't get lawyers actually often don't, they gum up the system sometimes more than lawyers. Not always, but often. People who represent themselves not only do a terrible job of it, you know, they don't know what's going on, and generally they don't just acquiesce and plead guilty. If you have to file your own motions or make your own arguments, it really slows things down. A good lawyer 
will look at the evidence, look at the discovery, and fairly quickly you know, be able to say, you know what, this is a case where you should plead to X. We could fight, we'd go to trial, but at the end of the day, you're not doing better than X, and you can resolve it now, and you know, maybe I can direct the judge to get you substance abuse treatment or, or get you something else. Are there some cases where lawyers throw a monkey wrench in, quote, waste time and spend money? Absolutely. We do 300,000 cases a year. There's some of them, and they may be minor cases or major cases, where for whatever reason, lawyers throw monkey wrenches in. And when I go talk to lawyers, I tell them, we have to be responsible for how we operate. And of course, they all say it's the prosecutors who are throwing monkey wrenches, and sometimes it is. But a, a justice system is never like an assembly line, and you're, you can't judge it by the exceptions where if we could fix them, we would. We want a system that as a whole treats people fairly, even if occasionally clients who I didn't like and were clearly guilty benefit from it because it protects the rest of us uh, to not have a system that basically picks those people out ahead of time and says, guess what, we've decided you're so guilty, we're not even going to give you the process we give other people on that. That would be, uh, but you know, there's no way for me to identify those cases. You could say they happen in the more serious cases. I'm not sure that's true. I hear about minor cases where people come in and claim sovereign, you know, they're a sovereign nation and they won't recognize the authority of the court. Uh, and so it happens uh, and I think the desire to fix that, I would, which I understand because I get letters from these people and they drive me nuts, uh, should not overwhelm the benefit we get from the system as a whole. Yes. Uh, let me, and I should have mentioned there is actually a very specific North Carolina provision. It seldom gets cited, and I think that's a mistake to overlook state constitutions. The Pennsylvania case I talked about won because it was a state constitution. Uh, Lori Dollar is here from AOC, and she'll probably tell me I shouldn't answer this question, but. <laughs> I know that the prosecutors who are part of AOC, some of them at least think that they would benefit from independence as well. That just what, they are also an adversary. They also shouldn't be in the court system. So for, and, and I'm not going to enter into the debate. I see some benefits from that. In the federal system, for example, the Department of Justice is the agency that houses the prosecutors, not their administrative office. So I think an argument could be made that prosecutors, while they don't serve the same constitutional function, serve a very important function that would best be served by them being independent. Other than that, I think the core constituencies within AOC are all related to the functioning of the court in a non-adversarial setting. One more question. We're going to give that to Roy. Um, what uh, role does uh, uh, private sector charitable funding play in user defense uh, anywhere, but specifically in North Carolina? Uh, very little. I will say foundations, for example, and we occasionally get grants from foundations tend to not support an ongoing position. For example, they won't fund a prosecutor or a public defender. They may fund training. We've gotten training grants and things of that nature. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, uh, which probably should be mentioned, is at least in Mecklenburg, and it used to be bigger than that, counties have chosen to step up and fund some positions. Mecklenburg funds both public defenders and DAs because they see a benefit, quite frankly, in moving cases. Uh, and, and on the jail population. Because one of the things you discover is if you provide too few resources, people get so overburdened they can't folk get the cases done, and it actually slows things down. And so in Mecklenburg, the county provides some funding. We don't receive much in the way of private funding. And there is there's some pro bono work. There are lawyers who will do it. Quite frankly, at $55 an hour, most of our private lawyers say there's a pro bono component. But there isn't like a, you know, we have law school clinics that do some work. But there isn't kind of a reliable, charitable, stream in North Carolina for, for providing engine defense. Thank you. So much. Thank you.